So I think, generally speaking, there are many, many open questions right now. Does the, the coronavirus influence the treatment? Or are there side effects connected with, with the coronavirus and chemotherapy? And I think these are really a, a lot of questions that not all of these questions so far have been answered. I mean, there are many more questions and answers at this stage. Um, and the treatment of Hodgkin patients really today is going, uh, continuing as, as it is right now, but certainly we have to uh, give more notice to the uh, risk of the patients uh, being infect infected by the coronavirus. You, you might know that um, our group is running mainly uh, in trials in first line and we um, divide the group of patients into early favorable, early unfavorable and advanced. That is very similar with other groups. Uh, however, in the, uh, the US and maybe also in the, in the UK, some groups sort of uh, just divide these Hodgkin patients into early stages and advance. So, and we, we and, and, and others such as the ERTC use early favorable, early unfavorable and advanced. And um, the early favorable patients are tr being treated with two cycles of chemotherapy. Ch chemotherapy today still is ABVD containing bleomycin and there are after uh, most of the patients receive a very small radiotherapy in order to, to uh, uh, improve long-term control. Early unfavorable, uh, we use four cycles of chemotherapy, so either four cycles of ABVD or two cycles of become escalated followed by uh, two cycles of ABVD. And then in the advanced stages, it's usually uh, four to six cycles of become escalated um, depending on on the pet. Pet nowadays is really has become very important because it allows us to better sort of um, decide how many cycles a, a patient should receive. Uh, and and for an example is for instance that in the past we used to to use eight cycles of bigger vasculated to really a lot of treatment, and today we by using the PET, we only need four cycles altogether and no additional radiotherapy. So I think that's that's uh, very, very, very helpful. If we discuss the role of, uh, of Corona in all that, um, I think we are <clears throat> or the, the highest risk for Hodgkin patients receiving chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Um, the highest risk there could be the impact of bleomycin because bleomycin is a lung toxic drug, as we all know, the most most long toxic uh, long toxic drug, and it's not very effective either. So, uh, bleomycin is not a very good drug, and um, that's why I think, particularly if if in doubt, and particularly in the these days where Corona might sort of uh, really damage lung tissue, um, we would be very careful and, and if, if uh, possible not giving these patients or treating these patients with bleomycin because bleomycin is uh, the most toxic drug for, for the lung and it's not really very effective at all. So uh, there are um, many groups that sort of abandon bleomycin altogether in these days um, and um, that's I think that's that's the the first sort of uh, consequence of the corona uh, uh, virus that more and more groups are sort of hesitant and there is um, also a randomized trial from the UK actually Professor Peter Johnson who randomized uh, six or eight cycles of ABVD or just two cycles of AVD and then 
four or six cycles of AVD, so bleomycin deleted, and this trial was published in the England Journal a few years ago, demonstrating that bleomycin, particularly in those patients uh, who receive four or six cycles of chemotherapy, really don't need any bleomycin, and I would think uh, that's that's uh, very important. And in this these corona times, uh, certainly we should try to avoid all lung toxic drugs as much as possible. Yeah, I think um, apart from apart from those things I just mentioned. Right now, there are little other um, commu or little other combinations that have been really uh, evaluated in a in a trial. So right now, we can just sort of watch these patients and eventually watch the lung function in these patients to see if there's a difference. Um, if patients are really sick from the coronavirus. You probably have seen many, many of these patients yourself or in the, um, in the TV or in, in different uh, setups like this. These patients who were struck with the coronavirus and have uh, severe lung damage, they, these patients might need longer time uh, to recover and if possible, the treatment should be postponed, allowing these patients to recover from a severe uh, corona infection. Um, it might be a bit different from those patients who are really uh, in relapse or multiple relapse patients, so really patients who really need um, treatment very urgently. That is then um, a more difficult situation, but uh, we would still, if the patient is fit, has no problems with, his, with the lung, we would continue um, because if you don't do this, then it, it, there, there's a high risk of sort of progressive disease and so forth. So that's why if these patients are not damaged by corona um, virus, then we would sort of um, treat them uh, as sort of standard of care, um, particularly those patients in, in as I said, men, uh, relapsed and refractory, uh, in order to see if we, if we can, can manage um, these patients without, uh, uh, um, particularly without bleomycin. I think there is no other drug um, that could replace bleomycin, but on the other hand, bleomycin is not very effective at all. So it's uh, uh, if you have patients or you're being sort of discussing this issue, I would say that uh, if the patient needs treatment and if um, bleomycin is involved in the, in the treatment, then um, in, the, in doubt, you should just delete bleomycin because the impact of bleomycin is on, on treatment outcome is dismal. It's, it's very, very little. Uh, only in, in the early favorable patients where these patients receive usually two cycles of ABVD and maybe radiotherapy, uh, the difference is 4%. So this is really a little, very small, tiny difference. And that's why I think... Um, we could easily get rid of bleomycin in all these uh, regimens, particularly if you have a high-risk patient, uh, maybe a patient who had pulmonary problems before, or a very old uh, patient. I mean, old patients are at, at higher risk for corona and bleomycin, so that's why bleomycin, particularly in elder pa elderly patients, should be abrogated completely because, as I said, this 4% uh, percent of uh, impact, uh, particularly in early favorable patients, doesn't really matter. And if you have an older patient, 
uh, it would be wise to not give these patients bleomycin. Uh, maybe the patient is fine when you start treatment, but then the patient might pick up uh, the coronavirus and then the, these patients is, might, might become really very ill. Those patients who are relapsed or refractory uh, and had many, many, many different treatments, these are the most difficult patients to treat. The very early stage patients, uh, that's not a big deal because they don't need much treatment and there they could be sort of, the treatment could be postponed even, but in those patients who relapse and are refractory, it is much more difficult and these patients certainly should have no bleomycin um, and it, the doctors have to be extra, give extra care on sort of avoiding pneumonia and if there are sort of lung, lung uh, issues that need to be sort of addressed, the lung function needs to be checked, that's for sure. Um, but if that is being done and if, if, if uh, the patients are not struck by a, an active corona infection, then uh, usually these patients do well. Those, those patients, on the other hand, who, let's say, relapse refractory uh, and maybe, let's say, after the first course of chemotherapy, then they receive um, uh, or have the corona infection. This is then, that, that's probably the worst scenario for these patients because then you might have to postpone chemotherapy in these high risk, very high risk patients. Uh, and then that's, that's very difficult because you want to have the lung sort of recovered before you continue with chemotherapy. And that might, in some patients, take a couple of weeks really. And you have this, these patients who already need uh, uh, treatment. Um, and that's, that's, I think that's the highest risk group really. These, those relapsed refractory, eventually even elderly, uh, these, these are the patients who, whom we should really try to avoid the corona infection. Those patients who have uh, malignant disease anyway or who suffer from Hodgkin's, those are the patients who really, really should um, be very extra careful, uh, even if they, let's say, don't or, or finish uh, chemotherapy, maybe a few weeks or months ago, but these patients would still be on a higher risk, uh, risk for um, coronavirus, for instance. So that's, that's something these, these patients should be um, on, on the alert. Doctors, I'm sure, are sort of aware of that. Um, because if these patients really catch the, the coronavirus and have severe infections, infection, then these, these patients are really uh, uh, more sort of uh, under, under and a threat for sort of uh, catching up additional uh, pulmonary uh, damage due to the coronavirus. Yeah, I think we are all struck by this by this crisis, and uh, very very few doctors and, and and specialists really were ready for this. Um, we are now beginning to learn what, how do we handle this, how do we treat these patients. I mean, we're talking about Hodgkin's today, but there are sort of many other, other um, diseases and, and high-dose chemotherapy, for instance, autologous stem cell transplant, allergenic transplant, so forth. So really many, many um, uh, conditions that are giving the patients and the doctors a really hard time. And I think that means uh, you have to sort of um, um, plan your treatment very, very carefully in order to, to um, avoid sort of, uh, or not, not having 
these patients at, at high risk for uh, some of these infectious complications. Thank <laughs> you.